speaker, he looks like a foreigner. He sounds like a foreigner, but he's not quite a foreigner to us in Malaysia. Why exactly is that? Can I? Let's join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Paul Barker. <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Keho. Paul, uh, David has been here for seven times. How many times have you been in Malaysia? Uh, my passport is stamped with Malaysia about 140 times. <laughs> What have you been doing in Malaysia? <laughs> I enter it a lot, which also means I leave it a lot. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I've been here as a tourist for seven years. Uh, it's, uh, they advertise it's a great place to be a tourist, so uh, I think why not take them up at their word. Uh, while I've been here as a tourist, I've seen the sites, so I teach in seminaries, uh, at STM mainly, uh, in Sramban and up here in PJ preach in different churches and uh, train preachers, but I travel a lot around Asia to do the same sort of thing, and that's why I'm in and out of the country all the time. And where are you actually from? Uh, it's hard to remember. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, as you can tell from my accent, which uh, doesn't quite rival David's accent, I must say. Okay, Melbourne accent is different from Sydney accent. I think I've lost mine over the years of living here. I don't, I don't quite sort of say I'm from Melbourne La. Not, not quite. Not quite. It would be interesting how your fellow countrymen will be receiving you. You are heading back to Melbourne to take up something different. Uh, yes, at the end of October I'll leave Malaysia for the last time. It'll be 150 times by then. And uh, I'll be uh, working in the Anglican Church in Melbourne, uh, which is where I'm from, uh, as an assistant bishop. Oh, that'll be an interesting challenge. Um, Paul, yeah, I know that you have been traveling quite extensively uh, as a visiting uh, 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 scholar and also a trainer and teacher throughout this entire region. Uh, in your various hats that you uh, in the various hats that you you play, um, can you share with us uh, as you train and uh, teach and preach uh, throughout this uh, ASEAN region and beyond? Uh, what are some of the things that you may have observed as uh, common needs in the training uh, ministry and also perhaps something that is particularly distinctive in terms of uh, particular encouragement for Malaysian pastors and teachers? Uh, I think there are lots of needs. Um, I think one need I see a lot in different places is, is simply better biblical knowledge. So if uh, Don was saying how important it is for us to have a good grasp and to read, reread, 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 reread uh, scripture, and, uh, and yet I keep finding people in Malaysia and other countries who, uh, who are quite ignorant about scripture and yet are at seminaries or are pastors. So, I mean, it's hard to imagine this, but I remember one pastor who had never read the book of Deuteronomy. Now. I mean, that's what my PhD was in. That's the only book of the Bible you need. <laughs> Paul plagiarizes Deuteronomy when he writes Romans. And he'd never read Deuteronomy. And that sort of thing is common. I think uh, a general biblical illiteracy. I think resources, of course. So I train preachers in Myanmar and teach in seminaries there, amongst other places. And people have no books. They've got no money to buy books, and so the lack of resources is quite difficult for some people. Um, within Malaysia, some of that's true, I think. Uh, students are a bit biblically unaware, uh, don't read very much. Malaysia is not a reading culture. And as Don said, and I would, e I would echo, we need to be readers, readers of scripture, but readers of theology and so on as well. Uh, and Malaysia is not a reading culture, unlike, say, Pakistan or India, where I teach. Um, I think that's something that Malaysian Christians need to uh, make sure you don't fall into that cultural thing. Mm. I think the one other thing, if I can say about Malaysia, not, not quite related to preaching, although it is in the sense of application. What I hear here all the time is the big issue is the government. Mm. And let me say, I don't think that's the big issue. The big issue is being right with God and proclaiming the gospel and winning people from the majority people group to Christ. 
The government may one day change, but it may not be better. And even if it's better, in the long run, it might be worse. That is, you come from the West, where everything is sort of, you know, corruption is sort of not quite so much, etc. But the, the, the ease of life in the West undermines the gospel so often. One of the big dangers of that, and I, si I, I sort of sense it often, is it grows self-righteousness. We're accusing them, but we're not looking at ourselves. We're not growing ourselves enough, in my opinion. That's one of the things I think I'm, I've seen so much of in Malaysia, if I can challenge you with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul, for that uh, um, uh, challenge. Yeah, I think we've been reminded earlier on that uh, what we pass on are the things that we are most excited about. Uh, and um, we preach the gospel, and yet when we are so excited about 1MDB. Yeah. Uh, see, it never fails to uh, get a response. If that's what we end up being most excited about, I guess the message becomes that. Yeah, and thank you for that uh, I was reminder. preaching yes, this weekend, the last three days, mm. from the book of Esther, and at the end of it all, the pastor's response was to read out the Ministry of Justice report from the United States. <laughs> and I thought... I don't think you've quite got it. I don't want to sound too critical, but anyway. Mm. <laughs> but we're not talking about 1MDB, we're talking about hashtag preach the word. Um, I don't even know what hashtag is. I thought it was something you had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> we can try that, eating hashtag for breakfast. <laughs> With baked beans on top. <laughs> You say you're from Melbourne again, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> there you not, go. Am not America. <laughs> okay, Paul, what keeps you going, preaching the word? Yeah. Uh, what keeps me going, I think, are, uh, in the end, individuals who are responsive, who grow, who get excited, who change, who preach well. And I, I think of some stun stunning examples. I remember a Chinese friend coming to Australia uh, to my church. I brought him there for three weeks. He was my student 11 years ago in China, went back to China, and then in a conversation with him, he was saying about how he's preaching. I said, Stephen, how did you learn about preaching, in effect, what we would call expository? He wouldn't know that word. He said, well, I saw you do it in your church, and I thought, that's how the Bible needs to be preached. I thought, wow, if only everyone could grasp it so quickly. Mm. Uh, I, I think of... Um, a, a guy who in, in Pakistan was my student in a preaching course a few times, and he spends all his time evangelizing Muslims by preaching the word. And he does that in the face of friends whom I've taught who've been killed since I taught them, uh, in a bomb attack in Peshawar, in a kidnapping in Karachi, and the bravery of holding fast to the word. And then earlier this year, I was talking to a, a young pastor, or a 35-year-old pastor in Siem Reap in Cambodia, who's become a good friend of mine, and a very humble sort of guy, training other pastors in his area. And he said to me that before the training we did last year, he felt dry and run out. He thought, I've got nothing else to say. But then as he understood expository preaching, he said, I've now got more than a lifetime to preach. And, uh, and he was so excited, his whole preaching and his ministry has changed. Uh, those are the things that sort of keep making me so excited. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for sharing that with us uh, this morning. Now, it is Malaysia because when you come to speak and at the podium, there is an air conditioning control. Well, let's, let's pray. Our great God and Father, your word is light and life for us. And we pray that you will write this word in our hearts, shine its light so that we may live and minister and serve for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. A long time ago, in a river valley far away, a young 
boy, a brave boy, picked up some stones and he hurled them and he killed a giant. And you too, if you are courageous, you can kill the giants in your life. Whether the giant is cancer, your mother-in-law, <laughs> your... I'm single, I don't have mother-in-law, so I didn't understand the joke. Uh, Maybe the giant in your life is your bishop <laughs> or the government. See, it's easy to preach, isn't it? You could take a story out of Scripture, find some little example, apply it willy-nilly, and bingo, there's your sermon. So easy, so easy to preach. And as one writer says, you might as well preach Napoleon. Why do we need the Bible? And so many people drift away from the Bible. They use all sorts of other examples, moral examples. Napoleon was very short, a bit like David, and he tried to kill the giants of Britain and other countries. What's the problem with that little example, apart from the sort of moralizing? One of the big dangers is the ignorance of context. I've heard lots of sermons on David and Goliath over the years from pastors and preachers and students in classes and so on. And almost never do they, do they go outside of 1 Samuel 17. Almost never. But the context of the chapter is so critical. In the previous chapter, David is anointed to be king by Samuel. And so what we have in chapter 17 is a, a contrast between Saul and David usually totally ignored by preachers. If you go earlier than chapter 16, we have the sequence of failures of Saul in chapters 13, 14, and 15 that in the end le lead him to lose his kingship. But that's ignored when people get to chapter 17. And if you go before that, of course, the quest for a king. We want a king like the nations, they say to Samuel. And God reassures Samuel and says, they're rejecting me, not you. And the issue of having a king is not just having a king in its own name, but having a king like the nations. But what God wants to give them is a king after his own heart, of his choice. Now I say that simply to raise the issue of context. That is, when we get to David and Goliath, we have an anointed king, boy really still, who is in contrast to the king like the nations, that is Saul, who has failed successively and repeatedly. And so this boy king who's after God's own heart demonstrates that. I come in the name of the Lord and bring victory. And therefore the victory is not just of a little boy over a great big giant, but actually it's the victory of God. But is that all we need for context? They say that context is king. But what I want to raise for us today is to think of the extent of context for a scriptural passage that we need to grasp. So you could go back to 1 Samuel 8, let's say, when they first ask for a king. And that would correct many things in your understanding of 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath. But I think there's more. On the other hand, we can get our context completely wrong or right to a degree, but wrongly done. I remember a student preaching a couple of years ago in Psalm 23, opening words of the sermon. The Lord is my shepherd. David is talking about Jesus. I thought, hmm, is that really quite right? At one level, yes, but at a big level... That's a quick jump. And so I'm using this as sort of slightly the opposite extreme. There's one extreme that just sees the stories independently, not part of a bigger story, and then the others that just simply see it as, this is Jesus, that's Jesus, this is Jesus. So how do we, where do we fit in the sort of spectrum of these? And, and as we think about the issue of context, 
I think one of the great weaknesses of Christianity, uh, and not just in Malaysia, but uh, I think in Australia as well, is that we read Scripture so fragmentarily. I'm not quite sure if that's the right word, but anyway, I hope you understand what I mean. So you can pick up our daily bread or variations on a theme, and today's verse of the day is from Jeremiah, and tomorrow's is from Mark, and the next day is a psalm, and the day after that is Genesis, and you're back to Galatians, and you feel like you're covering the whole counsel of God, but actually what's happening is these little verses isolated. It's almost as if the Bible is like a potpourri. I don't know if you know what potpourri is, but it's those sort of bowls people like in Australia. I haven't seen them here. Full of rose petals, and they're all independent rose petals to give you a nice fragrance and aroma in your house, that sort of thing. And you pluck out one, like a raffle ticket, and this is my verse for the day. Now, too many of us read the Bible like that. Our Facebook verse of the day, or our iPhone, or, you know, phone verse of the day that gets sent to our inbox or something, this is the verse to read. It's good to read scripture, but I'm not sure that's the best way. You imagine that you're in the church of Colossae, Paul's letter arrives, and so the person gets up and says, well, we don't get letters from Paul very often, so we're going to space this one out. I'm going to read a verse each week, but not necessarily in order. And so you read a verse from what we would call chapter 3 and the next day is from... That's not how to read it. We know that. We don't read books like that. We don't read the newspaper like that, etc. And yet so often our reading of Scripture is so fragmentary and disjointed. And so often preaching is like that. The preacher gets up and says, my text for the day, and they read a verse or half a verse. Or if you're Martin Lloyd-Jones... One word. <laughs> and the danger with that is that we don't encourage sound, robust, healthy Bible reading. We encourage people to randomly open their Bibles and pluck a sentence out, more or less. And therefore what happens is that we, we don't see how the Bible holds together as a unity and what happens is that when we're dealing with such a small text, it's so easy to make it mean what we want it to mean, or what we sort of think it means, but, what, but our thinking is not challenged. And one of the big issues of reading scripture is to get our worldview right, our big picture right. But we're unlikely to do that if we disintegrate scripture into fragments, because our worldview can sort of swallow them up. But when we deal with scripture as a whole, it then challenges more strongly our worldview to get it right. So how do we do this? What is context and what is the right dimension of context as we think about uh, reading scripture and therefore preaching scripture? Uh, when I teach preachers, I sometimes use an illustration of concentric circles. At the smallest circle, of, and this is the sort of circles of meaning, we could say, at the smallest level is a word. But one word doesn't really give us clear meaning. Words have a sort of semantic field of meaning. If I say, and this is the illustration I sometimes use, what does the word hand mean? Most people say this is a hand, so please give a hand to the person next to you. Nobody chops it off. But if I say, please give a hand to the person next to you, what do you do? Some clap, some help. Because please give a hand to somebody is ambiguous. Because that sentence needs another sentence around it to make it clear. So David Cook is carrying a heavy box, please give him a hand, means help. David Cook has just sung a beautiful aria from an opera, heaven forbid. And <laughs> does that mean you come up and help him? No, it means you clap him. So... That sentence for meaning needs a sentence around it for meaning. So in a way, word requires sentence. Sentence requires, we could say, a paragraph. Maybe that's enough. Does that mean we get our context right? Not really. A paragraph isn't enough. David going to kill Goliath, let's take, say, a hypothetical paragraph of that, is understood by something bigger than just a paragraph. A paragraph in biblical terms needs a chapter, 
but even a chapter. Surely a chapter's big enough to get our context and therefore our meaning right. I used to pastor a church in Melbourne that had an historic building, 1868 church building. Very attractive and very beautiful and very appealing for people to come and have their weddings there. And in our Australian law, we could have weddings for people who are not church members and so on. And it was a good opportunity to uh, share the gospel with people, etc. Our church building had also been used on television for a very famous wedding in a terrible soap opera series called Neighbours, which was for a time world famous. So when I went to England in the early 90s to study, everybody asked me about Neighbours, which I'd never seen. But because our church building was used, we had so many people come for weddings. And you would ask them about Bible readings, and the majority would say, oh, I like that passage about love is patient, love is kind. I'd say, oh, sure, we can do that. Let me tell you what it means. But if you take that chapter by itself, if I speak in the tongue of men or of angels and have not love and so on, down to of these three, the greatest is love, that, that chapter by itself is actually still lacking clarity of meaning. We think it's sort of beautiful poetry. I remember at high school, one of our secondary school teachers, not of my English class, but of my, uh, in the same year as me, he got his class to memorize that chapter because it was beautiful poetry. But it's not actually a poem extolling love fundamentally. If you read 1 Corinthians 13 in the light of 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 12, we realize that the things that love is, the Corinthians are not. They're puffed up and so on. And love is not that. They don't wait for each other at the Lord's table. Love is patient and so on. What I'm saying is that even one chapter of Scripture needs preceding chapters to get its context right. And, and so with David and Goliath, as I've said, you need to know those earlier chapters of Samuel. So how far do we go? Well, maybe the book is enough. That is, so long as I know the book from which I'm preaching... That's, that's the context. And let me say, I think, that that would be a very common view in Christian circles around our world today, in seminaries and in pulpits all over the world. Get the book right, that's what matters. So let me explain this view, why people advocate that, before we try and correct that. Very common, and you will know this to a degree, but maybe not quite see it in this connection for thinking about the whole Bible's unity. Very common is the view that the different writers of Scripture are writing of their own ability, their own thinking, their own emphasis, full stop. What I mean by that is this is Paul's view that's Jesus' view, that's Matthew's view, that's Moses, that's Ezra's view. And at times they don't have to agree because they're merely human views. They might be clever humans, they might be spiritual humans, but we've got to recognize this is Paul's view. Now these sorts of things are very common in seminaries as well as in churches, I think, around our world. So a very common view is that Scripture is not much more than merely human writing. It might be inspiring human writing, but it's just human writing. And because it's human writing, we should expect, and we do find, of course, multiple contradictions between different parts and authors of Scripture. So Paul will contradict James. Paul doesn't actually seem to have much to do with Matthew or Mark or something like this. Going back to the Old Testament, we have this great you know, sort of contradictions between Moses and later writers or between this elusive J writer and the P writer and the E writer and the D writer and the alphabetic writers of human construction. And they've put things together that, that, that are different or contradictory from others. The writer of Kings is contradicted later by the writer of Chronicles. 
uh, and so on. Ezra and Nehemiah are in contradiction with other writings as well. The books of uh, Kings may depend a little bit on Deuteronomy, but runs in the face of the priestly writer, uh, for example. We see Luke and Mark disagree with each other. They're, they're the sorts of things that are very common. And that's because the view that's so taken for granted often is that Scripture is humanly written, only humanly written, I probably should say. And therefore, there are internal contradictions. And if you've done any theological study, you'll know that they speak so often about the editors. The early version of the books of Kings or the Deuteronomistic history was thoroughly uh, optimistic in the time of Josiah, looking forward to a glorious future under his reforms. But a generation or two later, that book had to be re-edited because they're in exile, and so it's now pessimistic. Uh, but of course, the editor is always an idiot editor, in my opinion, because they leave behind the strains of things that they're trying to counter. So you've got optimism and pessimism, which of course fly in the face of each other. They're contradictory. So the book of Kings is internally contradictory. Now, I hope I haven't complicated you here, and I'm certainly not believing what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is what's taught in many seminaries, in Old Testament or New Testament studies. It's what you read in so many books that you pick up in Christian bookshops, etc. That view is, is sort of, uh, what should I say, increased or seen also in the way that people see the relationship of Old and New Testaments. So, for example, a teacher of Old Testament might say there is nothing in this Old Testament about Jesus. The New Testament is sort of superimposed and forced over the Old Testament. Old Testament teachers might say things like, we should actually read what the Jewish scholars say because they know the Old Testament better, what it really means, and we should prioritize Jewish interpretation and commentary of the Old Testament. I've heard that before, not that long ago and not that far from me here. And so the great divide between the old and the new, so that the new is just a, a sort of forced interpretation and therefore a disjunction, a, a, there's contradiction between the two. These ideas are very common. They're quite rampant in many parts of the world and not absent in this country either, in my opinion. Another part of this scripture is human writing is because it sidelines God, what happens is that, well, we can't really expect there to be such a thing as prophecy because you know, humans don't really predict the future. So the book of Daniel, well, that must be written after the Maccabean period in the second century BC, which strikes me as a fairly ludicrously late date for Daniel. And so it undermines the fundamental message of what's being said. The book of Daniel is saying Daniel is prophesying under God's inspiration for the future. But of course, we know it's not in the 6th century. We know it's in the 2nd century. And it's late. And it's after the event. So Daniel isn't prophesying. He's just reflecting what's already happened. Which, of course, then totally sidelines God. Puts him totally out of the picture. The same we could say for you know, other prophecies in Isaiah or other places. Oh, Isaiah couldn't be prophesying the exile because he's in 750 BC. So somebody else by the name of Isaiah has much later written the second Isaiah. And then there's a third. There's a whole family of Isaiahs. But none of them's predicting the future. Now, what I'm trying to do here, slightly caricatured, but I don't think unfair is giving you what is, what is often regarded as the main line or the central view of how Scripture is understood in our, in our world. And I don't mean to be putting down seminaries here because I teach in lots of them, but rather that, that those views are held by people who read books and people who preach and people who've gone through seminaries and so on. People don't quite realize the significance of some of these debates and, uh, and arguments. Related to this would be the view that the human authors, because they're only human authors, are bound by their culture. And therefore what they express is simply culture bound. We live in a different culture and therefore, well, we're not bound by what they say as well. Related to this would be seeing the Old Testament as a failure. 
And the New Testament is a success, a plan A and a plan B, because there's no inherent connection, really, between the two. We see that, I think, in, in a dispensational view, which I think is very common in Asia and, uh, and in Malaysia. The Old Testament is a sort of, is simply legalism. We, we, it's bad in essence, and the New Testament is good in essence, and they're, they're, they're thoroughly contradicted from it with each other. So Joseph Prince is like that from Singapore and a whole host of other preachers who basically divide the old and the new entirely. Well, as I say, they're common ideas, but they're wrong. I'm Australian, I'm blunt, I can say that. And the reason they are wrong, as I hope you've already grasped, is that scripture is not ultimately or just only written by humans. Behind scripture, writing scripture, causing it to be written in a whole variety of different ways, it seems, is God. God who's sovereign. God who not only knows what's going to happen, but plans what's going to happen. God who's absolutely sovereign over everything. God who not only causes things to happen, and as Don said before, interprets what's happened, but actually often, more often than not in, in a way, interprets in advance what is going to happen. So that when it happens, we know that it's God doing it, not just mere coincidence or history. Now I, I guess in this sort of sample of here today, what I'm now saying is, thoroughly accepted by pretty much everyone, I would guess. I'm wanting you to be aware of the objections that I've just gone through to what we take maybe too much for granted. That is the divine authorship of all of Scripture. And sometimes because maybe we don't quite think enough about it, some of these other views might creep in into the way that we think about Scripture as well. God is the one who speaks, who reveals himself. He causes things to be written in Scripture, sometimes, I guess, more or less by dictation. Amos, say this word, and it gets written down as well. But other times through human research, like Luke, who investigates and writes, and maybe the writer of Kings and so on as well. Maybe they're not aware of God's inspiring them to cause uh, Scripture to be written. We see so often the God who speaks, declares, announces, brings words of judgment or salvation or prophecy or interpretation time and time and time again throughout Scripture. Thus says the Lord. And when we get to the New Testament, we find, without exception, the sense that what is in the old is completed in Christ and will be completed in his return even more. That is, there is not a, a contradiction between old and new. Jesus, for example, on the road to Emmaus, as we famously know, said to, uh, well, after the road to Emmaus, that night said to the disciples, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, that's not just plucking one verse out because that whole context is interpreting for the disciples and the two men to, on the road to Emmaus initially and then the rest of the disciples how to understand the whole of the Old Testament. But Jesus had been saying things like that already in his pre-cross days on earth. Paul echoes the same sort of thing. The whole of Scripture referring to the Old Testament makes us wise for salvation in Christ. Now, I guess we take that for granted. We know that. We believe that. But what's being said here by Jesus, Paul, and you know, other verses I could find, of course, through the New Testament, is that we have a Bible that is unified. Yes, it was written by different human authors. Yes, in different languages. Yes, over one and a half or more thousand years apart. But ultimately, it is all caused to be written by the same God, sovereign God, the God who 
created everything, who knows exactly what will happen, brings it into being, and plans in advance for it. That's the God who's caused the whole of Holy Scripture to be written. So Scripture's unity matters. It matters very significantly. And what that then means for us is that as we prepare our sermons, as we think about the passage that we're preaching from, of course context determines me or, or influences or is king over meaning, but the context doesn't end in a paragraph or even a chapter or even the book that we're preaching from. The context extends from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation 22. Now that doesn't mean, thankfully, that we have to read the whole Bible every week as we prepare every sermon we preach. My goodness, that would, uh, that would stretch us. But it does mean we need to know Scripture from beginning to end. We need to read, reread, 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 etc. Uh, all of Scripture so often because it is one big book that is unified by a divine author. And yes, it has different angles and facets and emphases and so on, but they are complementary, not contradictory. And that flies in the face of a lot of scholarship, a lot of books that you'll pick up in Christian bookshops, etc. We need to be aware and alert to that. It doesn't mean those books are totally rubbish. Some are, but not all. Some of them have some useful observations here and there. But we need to guard ourselves to keep recognizing the unity of the whole of Scripture. Therefore, if we're going to be preaching the word faithfully, we need to have a robust doctrine of Scripture, understanding its inspiration, its sufficiency, its clarity, and so on. Now, if it is one big book, the next thing to think about is, how does it hold together? Because it's, in some ways, it's, it's still not quite obvious. One of the exercises I sometimes get students to do is this. I want you to write in 30 words or less, or fewer, I should say, a summary of the narrative story plot of the Bible. Condense the whole thing into 30 words. Now, that's not easy to do. And the standard answer I get is right, but it, it, it makes a point. God made everything good, but humans sinned. So God sent Jesus to save us, and we have our destiny with God assured, or you know, something to that effect. And what that answer shows is the absence of almost all the Old Testament. We've got creation, and we've got the fall, and we've got Jesus. But what about Abraham to Malachi? Now, I know that in a summary of 30 words, you've got to leave a few things out. But it raises the question, which I think is common, is we don't quite know how this big part of the Bible really fits the Bible story. One of the, no, not quite one of the first, but, but in the first year I was in Malaysia, I was preaching in a church uh, for a relatively newly ordained minister and, uh, who said, I, didn't, I never preached the Old Testament. I just don't know how to do it. It's too hard. I've preached in so many churches in Australia and in Asia where people say afterwards, well, we haven't heard a sermon on the Old Testament for a long time. And it's not just one pastor who said something like that to me, but several. That is, the Old Testament remains tricky, remains hard for us to see what is the big context. And that's why I think some people say, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, this is Jesus. And what happens is that we almost moralize, spiritualize, allegorize Jesus into the different passages of Scripture. Because we know it needs to lead to Jesus, but we're not quite sure how. You know, it's like that old Sunday school joke. The Sunday school teacher says to the little children, what is grey and furry and lives in trees and eats nuts? Oh, miss, it sounds like a squirrel, but the answer must be Jesus. <laughs> and so we often treat the Old Testament and say, well, I know this must be about Jesus, so I've got to, I've got to put Jesus in here somewhere. 
And the danger is we're tempted into a sort of forced fit, an allegory, a moralizing, spiritualizing sort of thing, or we simply condense the Bible and, and just sort of basically ignore the text and preach Jesus, or what maybe is more common is that we say something about the text and then say, and of course this all leads us to Jesus, and then we talk about Jesus and the gospel. And the Jesus bit at the end becomes very repetitive because it's the same every week. Well, tomorrow Peter will share a little bit more about how do we preach Christ through different parts of the Old Testament and, and the unity of Scripture. But at the moment I'm sort of a bit more foundational, I suppose. How does it actually fit together? Now many of you will be familiar with different ways of thinking about the Old Testament and New Testament fitting together from Genesis to Revelation. But there will be plenty of you, perhaps, I hope, who, for whom this still may be a, an area of sort of a bit foreign in thinking. Of course, whenever we summarize something, we, we leave things out and we, we overemphasize some things for the sake of a summary. But just for those who have never thought much about this, let me give you a couple of ways of thinking. One is, I, I think, firstly, the Bible is usefully understood in six sections. I've already mentioned creation. God made everything good. Then the fall, sin, is a very different era. And that's only 11 chapters of the first book of the Bible. But they're the first two sections, I think. The third section is the whole of the rest of the Old Testament. Now, I know that some quite popular books of uh, Bible overview uh, break this up into, say, three sections. It seems to me better to think of it in terms of 3.1, 3.2, 3.3 as not 3, 4, and 5, if I can put it like that. That is, the structure of thinking from Genesis 12 to Malachi is the same sort of structure of thinking pretty much of an earthly people in an earthly land with earthly blessings and, and so on, with a temple and king being added into that and a law being given to them. It, it basically is the same structure with, with bits unfolded as you go through. So I tend to think the third section is this. But how might we call that? How do we, if we're thinking about the Bible as one, how do we perhaps name these sections? Creation and sin, or I guess for the first two is sort of obvious enough. I, the best title I've seen for the third section is something like Redemption Initiated, Salvation Initiated or Begun. The, the, the point of the word initiated or begun is that it's saying it's not yet complete and that will lead us into the next bit. And, and therefore it's rejecting the view that this is a false path, a dead end, a failed plan A, and therefore we start again with plan B. So we need to think how does, if the, if the whole Bible is one story, redemption begun, initiated, I think is as good a title as any. And then when we get into the New Testament, the, the, the period of the incarnation up to the cross, resurrection, Pentecost, redemption completed, for example, it links the two together, it shows, it's saying to us that the Old Testament is leading into the new. But then after the resurrection Pentecost is a new era. The era of the church. Uh, I'm not sure the best title for this. I sometimes use redemption lived and proclaimed. Lived because we belong, we're redeemed. But proclaimed because it's not fully realized yet. We're sort of in between two ages from the resurrection Pentecost up to the return of Christ. And then lastly, new creation, which picks up the first title, creation, because the end of Revelation takes us back to the beginning, but is much better. There's so many links of language and words of, uh, from Genesis 1 and 2, the Garden of Eden, with the new Jerusalem at the end. Now, you know, we could pick a, a bit about the language and and so on. I'm just trying to give you a bit of a handle of thinking about the Bible's unity from beginning to end. Different books will do it different ways. They're the titles I prefer. Others you may know use the theme of kingdom. As I said, I think, I think the subdivision of Genesis to Malachi into three sections usually, I, I, I'm not quite convinced by that. I think they're, they're subsections of the section, not completely different ones. I think it's quite helpful sometimes to 
as you try and remember this, to even have uh, a little symbol. I, I'm indebted to Chris Wright for these, although I've adapted what he's got. Uh, creation, big tick. If I wrote it on the whiteboard, I think you won't see it, so I won't bother with that, but big tick. Sin, big cross, bad, fail. Redemption initiated, an arrow pointing further, because it's, it's looking to something more. Section 4, redemption accomplished, is again a cross, but the Calvary cross, not the bad cross. Lived and proclaimed is still looking to the future, and it ends with a big tick, the new creation. Now, I'm just trying to give you little, little handles on this. Another way I think of the, the Bible story, and I tend to prefer this sort of emphasis a little bit more than kingdom, although it loses something but gains something. Kingdom's got the sense of, of, of something over us, of God over us. But I, I wonder sometimes with the theme of God's presence more than being the king, maybe picks up a biblical emphasis that gets a bit lost, the relational side of it. Most of us don't know our kings and our you know, our sultans and so on, and we're probably quite pleased about that, but uh, the idea of relationship is very important in Scripture, and, and maybe in the image of king is lost a bit. In the first section, creation, God and people are together perfectly, in harmony. But the second section, separated, kicked out of Eden, distance between. And then what we see in the third section is that God takes a step into the sinful people, in the middle of the tabernacle temple. But behind curtains, there's still distance, but he's made a, a, a closer step. And then that step becomes closer again in the incarnation, where God draws closer to people. They see Jesus. They're with him. But then again, a, a further closer step, with the presence of God by his Spirit in the hearts of believers. And finally, of course, face to face. Now again, whenever you summarize, there are weaknesses and strengths, and we've got to keep all those things in balance. But for me, I, I think that's a help, helpful way of thinking about the whole Bible story. And also then, as we think about God making the step into the tabernacle temple in the middle of a sinful people, we're recognizing something fundamental in that Abraham to Malachi step, that it's God's grace and God's initiative to keep going with this people that we're not dealing with a sort of legalistic system that's then contrasted to grace, but the Old Testament has grace abounding as well. One of the other things I think is good to emphasize is to see how the Abrahamic promises that begin the uh, redemption-initiated section actually drive the Bible's story to its end. The promises of descendants, land, blessing, and blessing to nations. I think four is a good way of categorizing them. Uh, often people leave out the last one. Uh, seems to help us see a sort of like a north-south highway running through uh, the Bible story of those four promises interacting with each other, but at different times one or the other on dom dominating the landscape. So when we come to David and Goliath, the big issue is that the, the promises to Abraham are under threat by this giant of a Philistine trying to kill the descendants of Abraham and take their promised land. And that's why God is reacting to them, not just because he's a little boy who's brave. And so we see it in the context of these promises to Abraham that are supplemented by the promises to David of king and temple. So the four-lane highway becomes a six-lane highway which drives us ultimately, of course, to Jesus where we see a transformation of understanding of these promises to Abraham. Uh, from a bicycle to a motor car, as someone puts it. So who are the descendants of Abraham? Those who believe in Jesus, Jew or Gentile. The land is a heavenly inheritance for us. The blessings of the old that fitted the earthly land are now the spiritual and heavenly blessings that fit the heavenly land that's promised our inheritance. The nations, of course, even more prominent in the new, and the king and the temple both finding their fulfillment in a person, uh, not a building, and that's Jesus, of course. Now, I'm just trying to give you some examples here of thinking about the Bible as one big story. Because I've, going back to where I started, God is the divine author, and therefore we have a unity of Scripture, not mutually contradictory human authors, which is so commonly thought. If it is a big story, 
then how do we understand that story? So I've just tried to give quickly some simple ways of thinking about that to help us understand the, uh, the unity of the Bible in six stages, I think, is the best way to do it, and trying to show you some of the other emphases. And then if we, uh, to just draw a couple of conclusions briefly, we need to recognize that this story takes us from, from beginning to end, from creation to new creation. And the passage that we're preaching from, we need to understand it in that full biblical context. So I'm using it vertically now rather than horizontally, but anyway. So if we're preaching on an Old Testament passage after the fall, Genesis, Abraham to Malachi, we can't simply jump out of that, what some people call across the river, to today. Now, one great trainer of preachers used to say, you've got to go to Corinth before you go to London. And, and that's fair enough, I think. But, but where that could be misunderstood is that we're dealing with a passage, say, in Chronicles about healing the land. That's Malaysia. We need healing. We need to humble ourselves so God will heal Malaysia. What's happened there is we've, we've lost the sense that the Bible is one story, one narrative from beginning to end. And rather than lots of bridges across the river, some of which are wide and some narrow, it's better, much better, safer, I think, to see that if I'm preaching from redemption initiated, I need to see where does that lead me to in Christ and beyond the resurrection and so that we live in the fifth section, lived and proclaimed. Yes, there's a few differences, but they're minor. We could say the river is narrow if we want to keep that illustration, but it's, we need to walk along the river through the Bible story, see how the themes, the issues are, are transformed and so on in Christ before we then think about linking across the river to our own culture and issues in which we live. So by way of thinking about preaching, we need to understand every passage we preach in the fullest biblical context. Context gives meaning, and if we draw up short and stop simply at the book that we're preaching from, we're in danger, I think, of not quite getting Scripture right. Many people call what I've talked about biblical theology. Trouble with that expression is that it actually means lots of different things over history and in theological interpretation. Uh, so don't think biblical theology always means the same thing. But secondly, a danger, I think, of using the term is this, that it's suggesting this is one method of reading Scripture. One of the first things I did, I remember when I was in uh, Malaysia, I guess now six or over years ago, I uh, was given a lecture, and somebody said, oh, isn't, isn't your approach biblical theology? And my response was something like, if I remember this rightly, well, yes, but that's just how we're meant to read Scripture. It's not, it's not a, a sort of particular method. It is simply how to read Scripture rightly. That is, it's one big book that has unity from a divine author. Yes, there's complexity. Yes, there's shifts and transformations. But if I'm going to preach on a passage, wherever it may be, I need to understand it in the, in the breadth and length of that unfolding biblical story. That's simply how we're meant to read Scripture, and thus to help us preach it faithfully as well. Thank you, Paul. The Bible really is one book, isn't it? How often uh, we forget that. And at, at uh, what great loss indeed. 